Hi, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for turning up, even if it's because you've only accidentally turned up and it's the, your talk's next. Um, and I'm here to talk about rename, which sounds an odd topic. But actually, I'm talking about the whole problem of how do we persist and recover state? You know, why do we persist and recover state? And the answer is, we do that so we can get what our data back later. This is how we used to save state. We used to have little DOS boxes. We used to, there was an API designed for a single process. Nice and simple there. Nick's nodding in familiarity because he still has these at home. This is a 6502 bootloader, by the way. Then we moved on to hard disks. Finally, we had gigabytes worth of data. We had multiple users. You've got multiple processes. This is where POSIX came from. POSIX is the one true API for storage. We have files, we have directories, we have rename, and we can open files with a guarantee that they're not there before. This is what most programs are built on, the assumption they're on a hard disk. Hands up who's got a hard disk. That's really good. Hands up who's got a multiple exabyte data storage facility somewhere in a desert near a hydroelectric plant. Everybody using cloud storage has one of these. Hands up who's using S3 as your storage photos on Facebook. Yeah, that's exactly it. So the thing is, we've moved on from floppy disks to buildings you have to drive around with a golf cart. And yet, we're still, we still rely on things like rename to actually get our work done. Yeah, because we've evolved models and APIs in our brains and in our code to deal with data. The most fun, fun enough, one of the core models is actually relational algebra, or as it's known, SQL. It, you, know, it, it, you use that, it's somebody else's problem to deal with how things get stored. You have to talk about transactions in their isolation, but generally, it's somebody else's problem. You take a step down, you're into the world where I live in, which is actually the layer underneath things like SQL and other stuff, where we're, we're still trying to maintain that metaphor. Now we've got a POSIX API, similar-ish. Our file systems, we still have files and directories. But now, now we're working in those giant data centers. The file systems are distributed. We, we're, we're behind that single API, the interface. All the main, all the Hadoop stack applications work underneath. We wrote it for HGFS, but now we glue in all the object stores. Hands up in the audience who is using any of those applications at the top. Keep your hands up if you're working with any cloud object stores from them. OK, two or three people up there. Now, a core part of this in your code, if you're using it as a destination for all this work, is we absolutely rely on rename as the way of committing our work. You're doing any query in Hadoop, MapReduce, Spark, whatever. We copy the data. I missed the slide, actually. We rename stuff. We, you write your data into a temp directory in your final destination. You can have hundreds, thousands of tasks running. You can have tasks speculating, working on the same data simultaneously. The first one that finishes sends a message to the job manager and says, I'm done. Job manager, if it's happy with it, says, OK, you're ready to commit. And we can, use, we can commit that in a single transaction. This works because we rely on the fact that data we store in Hadoop HGFS, all the data, the terabytes worth of data, lives scattered across the cluster in data nodes. But we have the single metadata store, the name node, which actually stores our directories and trees, the metadata. So the commit operation only takes place in that single server. We can lock a bit of the file system. We can do a transaction. We can save it. It's essentially a database with database operations. So nice and simple. We do a rename. In contrast, Amazon S3, we've put a lot of effort into making the object store look just like a file system to keep all those people writing the code above happy. It looks like a file system, except it's just one of those metaphors that if you push hard, it will absolutely collapse on you. Here's the problem. There is no metadata. There is no name node. There is just a model in your head of what you think is one based on the API alone. In reality, your data gets stored over different shards, and the location of your data, the specific shards you use, is determined by a hash on the file name alone. That means. You can't rename a file. There is no files to rename. There are only blobs. And if you want to give it a different name, you actually have to copy it from one machine to another, which takes about six megabytes a second. 
So to do a rename, we pretend we're doing a rename. We do a list. We do an explicit copy of every single block of data. And then finally, we delete the old craft. People using S3 as a destination for work in Hadoop MapReduce, and especially Spark these days, they talk to us and they say, hey, your transactions are taking really low. Why is it at the end of my process? I've done all the work, and my machine just sits there, not doing anything for about 10 minutes. It worked really well in development. And the answer is, is because that copy operation is time is proportional to your data size. But the thing you have to worry about is not the time it takes to commit. It's that little list up above. Because for list to work, we have to have a consistent way of listing all the data in the object store. And Amazon S3 does not list data reliably. So you may actually miss the output of a single task, one or two files. We do the copy. We delete everything. And your code can keep going happily, not realizing that actually you've generated corrupt data. And it can take a while to propagate. The worst thing is, everything appears to work really well during development. It's only when you go into production it goes wrong. It's mostly when there's only intermittent misbehaviors on S3 that it really becomes visible. So that's a problem. And that's a problem I've been fixing. And the way to do it is we throw out all our assumptions about data, about storage, about files, and say, this is an object store. Let's embrace that fact. Let's stop hiding from it and pretending that it's actually a file system. Let's go with what Amazon offer. And the secret is here, actually, is they use something called multi-part uploads, where we can write data to a single address. We can start a transa an operation, which is effectively transacted, to say, I want to write my data to the object store. You get a URL back, and then I can do repeated posts to that file. But it doesn't come into existence until I issue the final post saying, create the object. Here is the order D tag list of my individual uploads. We've been using this for a long time in the output of when you're writing stuff to S3 via the, the Hadoop S3, S3N, S3A clients. But we've just been doing it on the same process. So you write your stream, you close it using the POSIX APIs, and all is well. But it turns out we can be more devious about that. We can upload the individual blocks from one individual process as we go along. But we can commit the data on a different machine or even abort it. So we change the transaction operation, not from a rename, the commit, but more the job manager decides whether to actually post the completion operation of those writes. So we put the stuff up there. Once we're actually happy with it, the task can communicate. And we can decide there and then whether to upgrade this stuff or not. So we've got the two pending uploads. We do a list. That requires consistency. Separate problem. I'll ignore that one. And we just do a post. So that we're using the transactions built into the object store. So we can get away with all this stuff working transactedly. I'm actually going to give a demo of this so I can get it working, actually. This is my, my Spark unit tests. Not particularly exciting, but we can actually simulate the two different commit operations. And we have a special mode now in the S3 client where we turn inconsistency on. We can add a lag on deletion. This is going to take a while, because we're over a slow network. I'll go back to talking. So if you actually turn the inconsistency on, then everything dramatically breaks every time. And we can show that the file output committer, the normal one, is both slow and, in the presence of inconsistency, leads to corrupt data. So I'm going to have to get rid of it. And that's what I've done, basically. This code now exists. You can download it. We're going to feed it back into Hadoop 3 before long, which will come out later in the year. And then you'll be able to use it from Hadoop MapReduce and Spark. Has this code finished yet? No, it's still going on. Hang on, this one. So step one, we change how we commit data. We, we affect the, the first big corruption problem. But there's a lot more in that POSIX world that we have to look at and say, is it dead? Is it obsolete? How would we do it differently, given we assume we've got an object store there? And the key one is this whole notion of, I'm going to open a stream of data and read it byte by byte, seeking sporadically. It's probably the one we've got to look at and say, it's dead. For things like HTTP requests, especially looking at HTTP 2 coming along, we actually want to issue overleaved, you know, bulk requests of byte arrays saying, 
here are three, here are three different offsets within this, this very large multi-gigabyte object. Let me do gets on them. Overlaid. Because right now, you read an input string, your process goes, OK, give me the data from offset 10K, 200 kilobytes of it. We do that read. Then immediately, the client says, oh, I want this extra data here. And when, so the file system, we have no idea what's actually going to be needed next. Your program does, especially if you're actually using a column of data format like Orc and Parquet, it knows exactly in advance what it's going to be skipping. So can we actually move the APIs on to doing this world? Or alternatively, look at it, what APIs can we implement in the file systems and the object stores that application users are actually going to take up on? Because I could write, put the effort in, write this stuff. And if it doesn't get used, it's just kind of wasted. So anybody working this layer, get in touch, and we'll think about what to do. Now, did that finish? Yeah. I've got two tests doing a commit. First, this, the new one, nice and happy. Takes a while, gives the diagnostics, times everything. The other one, big, long, random pause, and it fails because there was no data there. And that, this, is, this is the default state right now you'll get. You won't necessarily see a failure because your code won't have assertions about the number of files that get generated. You'll just say, run the query, query returns, all is well, except there is no data there later on, or you're missing. You're missing a couple of parts of your data. And that's why right now, I would not recommend anyone using S3 as a destination of work to, from Hadoop or Spark. Does anyone do that in the room? If you are, oh, you keep your hands down now. So it's really dangerous. It looks nice, but it's really dangerous. So stop it. We will have a fix right now coming out later in the year. If you're really in a rush to do it now, a big chunk of the code I'm using on is actually based on something from Netflix. OK, so you go to Netflix code repositories, and you can pick up what we've been using. So we need to rethink. We need to look at POSIX and say, is POSIX dead for the new file stores? And the answer is, maybe, but the API can survive. But the other thing is, there is one more storage model coming, and it's actually high-speed, non-volatile memory attached to the main board of your servers, of your laptops. It's the stuff people like Intel working on. You're getting SSDs that will go on cards right now you can slot in. The next generation of stuff they're promising is going to be even faster. It's not going to be as fast as DRAM, maybe 10x, 100x slower, but it will fit straight into main memory. You'll be able to address it through your program. And when your program goes down and comes back up, all your state will be there in memory. So you can even bypass the loading and saving phase. You can just map it straight in. Now, again, there is a POSIX API here. I'm using C at this point, as it's the language you can get at it, where you can basically say, here's a file. I'm going to map it straight into memory, and then you can do pointer operations on it. So I can define a C struct, map it into memory, work with it, and then save it back. That is what we have right now. And it's there. Does anyone in the room who will use it, don't this? OK. It, it does work today with POSIX, but it works because we're in charge of when things get synchronized. We really are writing it back to a file system. So I can do stuff like I can take a field in a record. I can just add five to it. It might be an atomic increment operation. I could then copy that field one to field two. Again, if it's a multi-threaded process, I might need to put a lock on it. But I can get away with it, because I know we don't actually synchronize till the end. If we're looking at non-volatile memory, that's gone now. Each write operation to the file system, to your memory, is potentially a write to the store. So I increment that first operator, find increment field one. If your process crashes at that point, your, your struct may not be consistent. I do a field copy, field one, field two. So yeah, I've done it now. My struct is now consistent. My data is now correct. But what happens if actually the CPU has only got that data in level one cache? It's not been written back to the non-volatile memory yet. So your code carries on thinking, hey, I've written my data structure. Aren't I happy? But in fact, it's not persisted. Your system crashes, you come back up again. You're in an unknown state. So effectively, we've moved the transaction problem away from the file system, the opposite direction from the object store. And now it's how we access data and memory. I'm not working on any of this. There are people doing it in academic space already. There's lots of papers you can read on it if you want. 
The key point is nobody quite knows yet what is the best API and model to work with here. It actually looks very similar. The research stuff is about using things like log structured formats and stuff, log structured files, where I, I write new records. I don't ever do overwrite fields in place. I create new, new struct, new records, then update references to it. Oh, and by the way, I can't use absolute pointers anymore because you've got to use offset references or something like that because, of course, memory addresses change. So it's not going to be free in this world. We have great opportunities for speed and performance, but it's going to require us to rethink what our applications do. We're going to rethink how we do transactions, and maybe we're going to have to go back to C, okay, because it's the language of pointers. And are the other languages on top, and I'm pointing at Java in particular, are going to have to rethink how we model memory if we want to take advantage of this world. So, key point then, storage. It's moving in two ways. We started off on the floppy and the hard disk. One direction, we're into things the size of Facebook and POSIX, I think. We're hacking it, the APIs to make them look like POSIX out there, but the metaphor is really starting to fall apart, and we're going to need to do something there. But the other direction, again, the hard disk has become an SSD. The SSD is moving onto the mainboard. The chip manufacturers are saying, we're going to go even faster. And again, POSIX, POSIX doesn't fit into this world. You can make it look like it does. We've had RAM disk, we've had RAM FS for a long time. But to really, really get to the benefits of this new world, we're going to have to go back to pointer references and somehow get into the languages and the APIs a model of transactedness into that address. And finally, SQL will survive, or variants thereof. Okay, if you live in that space, it becomes somebody else's problem. You better make sure they get it right. You better understand how your, your database does any form of transaction. But otherwise, you're pushing it down to people, and it's not you. So we've got a very short time for questions. So are there any questions? Let's give Steve a round of applause. Hi. Hi. So I'm doing everything I shouldn't do. Reading well done. Reading files from S3, uh, writing to them. Um, honestly, I didn't really uh, run into any problems up until now because the data is small. But uh, what should I do if I do run into problems? You're running on S3. Yes. Stop it. Uh, but where to? <laughs> Next question. Super? You're not even going to know you've got a problem, maybe. You could at least check. But otherwise, you won't necessarily notice you've got corruption. OK? Where you should I save my stuff? Um, you can put it onto something like HDFS and then copy it over at the end of your work. Okay, you get a bit better performance there. If you're using Microsoft Azure Storage, it's actually fast and consistent, so it all works nicely. Okay, but S3 is unreliable. The enemy is normally list consistency. So even if you, if you get everything a unique name, you're not going to worry about update inconsistency. But the listings, it can be slow to discover data, it can be slow to find deleted data. Everyone's code assumes everything is consistent. Okay, and I think you know that's those APIs and it's a little mental model on our head. We're all stuck in floppy disk land. Thanks. All right. Two other questions. Hi, Steve. Great talk. So the, you, you didn't mention uh, EM or FS, which Amazon have produced, and Netflix, as you know, also have Semper, and Spotify have done something similar. OK. We uh, are what's actually, your opinion on them? OK. We are implementing something in Hadoop, which actually, all these things that use DynamoDB as a consistent metadata store. We actually have something in Hadoop coming up that way too. In fact, if I rerun my test with a minus D, I think it's local Dynamo, I can probably actually get it working where we use Dynamo for this stuff as well. What it actually delivers is two things. You get the consistency so rename works, but you're still using, you're completing your transactions in operation that takes lots of time. Okay, so that's the problem. It's still taking time to commit, which is why I've been collaborating with Netflix on this faster committer because they have that commit delay problem and because DynamoDB runs up large bills. So Amazon, they're committed to it. The thing we're doing, Seaguard, yes, it's the place from Game of Thrones, is going to deliver it too. What they also deliver, the IMDB, is it's a lot, lot faster to list. We do a get in HGFS. 
to actually see if a file exists to list something. It takes about 400 milliseconds. You can actually see pauses in the logs while we list directories and analyze. And that really kills performance at the beginning of any query, Hive query, Spark query, where it enumerates the directory, or worse, it does a directory tree walk to say, what data do I have? And that's a real performance killer. DynamoDB, you can actually get it really fast. The problem is you do have to pay up front for your IOPS. You get billed more for it. So it's a trade of cost versus time. If you want to learn more about storage, Jim, you can come and ask me afterwards. You know, maybe start a project on it. OK. We're out of time if you have more questions. Call me later. Talk to see you later. Let's thank him again. <laughs>